everyone, it's Shreya from HealthSpan. Today we'll be doing something a little different from our usual videos. Recently, we had the opportunity to interview HealthSpan's advising physician, Dr. Rick Cohen. In this interview, we discussed several frequently asked questions related to longevity and health tracking. The primary focus of our conversation was on interpreting and utilizing lab work effectively to inform health and wellness interventions. Dr. Cohen is a physician and functional medicine doctor with over 20 years of experience in the medical field. He has dedicated his career to the treatment and prevention of lifestyle and metabolic related diseases. His goal is to help his patients unlock the keys to achieving optimal health. Now, let's go ahead and get started and hear from Dr. Cohen as he addresses some crucial questions with regards to lab work, longevity, and wellness. The metabolic health markers, so, you know, the ones that we've laid out for them, because ultimately, Metabolic health is, you know, the key mm, fundamental, you know, marker of how we're producing energy, you know, and how efficiently we're producing energy. And when we're not producing energy efficiently, that cascades, you know, to cause many different problems and is at the core of, you know, the four key health span, you know, age related issues, you know cardiovascular, cognitive, diabetes, immune. Um, I mean, those, those are the ones that get you. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so um, context depending on your age, depending on what other things that you're doing, your gender, you know, medication. So that there, there are a variety of different pieces, you know, your goals, um, your initial concerns. So we, ha we have to put everything within that context. And one marker may not be significant. On the other hand, one marker may be significant. So it, it's, it's, it's something that um, we should pay attention to. The other important thing is it's a long game we're playing here. You know, we're, we're not we're not into the longevity space for I'm going to feel better tomorrow. We're in for the longevity space for <clears throat> two ways, right? One is how do I live healthy, youthfully longer, right? Longer, like many years. And perhaps as I go down that path and stay healthy, how do I, you know, how do we figure, which is my primary passion to sort of do some resets you know so we're actually resetting the cells so we perhaps can get past that 100 110 limitation that we have now so long game long game trends labs can vary so what's more important than a singular lab um, is a trend in a lab you know someone could have had an infection someone could have been stressed like you know so if i took a an Ironman runner and I happened to draw their blood the next week and they didn't tell me that they did an Ironman on Sunday, you know, there'd be some huge inflammatory markers. And the context was I did an Ironman on Sunday, right? So, um, so you have to play those into, and if it's a one-off, not a problem, but if someone's doing an Ironman every Sunday, you know, unless they're a Superman, it's affecting them. So context. Good, good question. Um, through, we can get a little more granular depending on what, what inflammatory marker. If they're just looking at a C-reactive protein, you know, it's not very specific, right? And it, it can vary. You can actually get, it's interesting, um, True Diagnostics, which I know you guys are now hooked up with, um, 
offers a epigenetic CRP um, correlate, which is actually more accurate than actually serum because it's picking up the underlying epigenetic proteomic changes that then correlate to the serum. So while the CRP can fluctuate, the epigenetic CRP surrogate doesn't with as much. So that's that's interesting. But it, it's really looking at more robust markers. You know, one of the things I look at is glycan age can be, and that's a, you know, with regard to physical activity, that's a strong influencer on these glycans, which are sort of these salis sal sialic glycans that wrap on top of proteins and they can change their structure and shape as we get older as well as change our structure and shape with inflammation and frequently you'll see someone who might be doing too much you know see have a glycan age that not as good as they would expect and there are a whole variety of other markers that um, we're beginning to look at as well you know so someone at home heart rate variability, sleep, you know, depth of sleep, you know, things, things of that sort can, can be really helpful body temperature, you know, as well. So we can be more precise. How do you feel? Right. And, and what's, what's your goal, right? Like, and these are important questions. So if someone's trying to figure out that they, if they have chronic inflammation, are there any markers that are less affected by exercise? that are more of like a long-term inflammation marker? The, the glycan age would be the glycan age. sort of a, a long-term inflammation. There's some uh, some new novel markers. And, and some of the markers are acute and chronic. So like there are markers, so there's a cytokine, something called IL-6 that actually goes up immediately, but then can come down. So there's physical activity is you know, a, a anahormetic response in some ways. It's it's challenging your body to get stronger. It's challenging the mitochondria to become more efficient, to to increase their numbers, right? To be getting back to energy. It's all about energy production. But just like you need to sleep to recover, if we're not allowing the body that ability to recover, then we're defeating the purpose. So... Um, physical activity is, you need to reference it to what's your goal. Like, are you a competitive athlete? That's not a longevity fitness, you know, uh, philosophy, you know, in, in some ways it's like, do as little as you need to do to achieve the signal that you want to achieve. Um, it's not about being well, for some, it's about showing their picture, right? Look how lean and muscular I am. But that's not necessarily longevity. That's just someone who's working out hard and adjusting their diet. And that doesn't really mean you're going to live longer. It means you look better, right? So you, you feel better about yourself. Um, it's understanding that maybe it's one hard effort a week and it's some long walks and it's the strength for legs and arms and it's some balance and that's all you need to be fit and challenge the body. The other is extra and that's okay. But that, you know, you're, you're getting into the, you know, the, the end of the curve where too much is, is actually not good. So how do you, how do you, how does someone know? <laughs> like some of the testing, some you just know, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I think most people could. It's less of a problem for the for the United States, but I, I think people probably know. So I do a I exercise stay I exercise for fitness and longevity. I do an upper body and a leg workout each one once a week, and I used to do it twice a week. And I said, yeah, maybe I can do it with just once a week, and. I said, I'm really, I don't have any long-term goals per se, other than some functional strength markers. You know, can I hang from a bar? Can I, can I deadlift, you know, my body weight or more for a minute? Things, things of that sort. Um, farmers carry. If I'm doing a workout 
and I'm doing it once a week, I want to get one rep better every week on each exercise. And if I can do that, that means I'm doing enough of a stimulus and enough of recovery to be getting stronger and more efficient in that activity. If I am not achieving that, then something's off and it gives me a marker. I used to do that with two times a week, but now I could do it with one time a week and I'm still improving. Maybe I'm not improving as fast, but I'm improving and that's good enough, right? So um, hedging my bet that that is enough that to know that I'm improving as opposed to trying to, with the knowledge that I'm not over pushing it if I'm giving a week in between, you know, an upper body or a lower body. So that's that's an intuitive way. Cut back and sort of see how are you doing if you have a, you know, if you're you're on a cycle and you're generating power, you know, are you improving in a certain aspect of that? Again, it's a long game. So as long as you're continually improving, do as little as you can. <laughs> If someone was metabolically healthy to begin with and they just, you know, decided to go on a vacation, just didn't care, right? They just were going to do whatever. And other than not feeling, noticing the difference and not feeling great, you know, a couple of weeks is not going to cause a long-term issue. You know, insulin resistance doesn't occur in a couple of weeks. It's a year, many year endeavor it's a project to achieve that however if someone who has spent many years achieving and building that, that foundation of metabolic you know um, inefficiency has only been good for a few months and they fall you know they haven't taken the time so it depends on where you are and how much you've recovered and how much you've sort of been able to reset you know that that mechanism um, one of the philosophies we use in something called mTOR cycling, right? So use rapamycin, use fasting, use lower calories for a period of time. But then, you know, someone really wants to make gains is eat a lot, you know, for two or three weeks, right? But if you eat a lot for two or three weeks and you're active and you're strength training, those nutrients are going to be taken up predominantly by the muscles and you're going to get a growth and recovery and you know repair in a number of ways as long as you aren't overdoing it and you might put on a little bit of body fat but you're going to put on more mass and then you go into a cut phase you're going to lose a little muscle but you're going to lose more of the the fat and that's an old bodybuilding competition they know that right put on a lot of muscle then cut and they will do it to the extreme, but that three to four week time period of excessive calories, not an issue. The caveat is um, make it carbohydrates, not junk oils, right? So if you're going to eat, eat protein, eat carbohydrates and exercise. So someone's going to eat carbohydrates, right? It's a short term thing. You could burn that off. You could go run. You could go take a walk. You could do some squats. It's not going to be an issue. You eat crap oils, excuse the language, it gets incorporated into your cells. And that takes a lot longer time, you know, to sort of cycle things through. Hmm. Makes sense. So it's cool. it's really not necessarily the calories. It's the type of calories and the source of food, right? So, um, if someone wants to just have protein and rice and potatoes and sweet potatoes and gluten-free, whatever, but a lot of it, that's less of an issue as opposed to I'm going to eat at McDonald's every day, you know, for a month. That's a problem. I think we're we're looking we're 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 being overly cautious with that, you know. I, I, and I would honestly say that it's like, could we go a little bit longer? But you know, we don't want to miss a signal. So, initially, certainly as you're taking it, as you're 
your body's adjusting it, you know, being able to see any imbalances, we can react quicker, you know, and perhaps it's, you know, you're just doing a base panel, you could do a more comprehensive panel, we begin to look at some of these metabolic shifts, specifically with regard to the dose and frequency, because we might need to adjust the dose and frequency, you know, are you suppressing mTOR1 and suppressing mTOR2? And, you know, has your body had enough time to let mTOR2 recover? So if that's the case, instead of taking it weekly, it might be best to take it every 10 to 14 days. Um, if also we see some consequences metabolically, we can suggest using some AMPK nutrients, which sort of counteract the, the mTOR2 suppression, or even a little bit of short-term fasting can counteract that mTOR2 suppression and perhaps lessen the rapamycin's, we'll call it, window. There's, it's just that it, there's a window there where we want mTOR1 and just a little mTOR2. Um, rapamycin is you know, been shown effective across all species, but it's not 100% pure for its target, for we, what we want to achieve for longevity. And there, there are some rapalogs out there that are being developed for mTOR1 purity that aren't available, but when they are, the concern is they will be quite expensive. So, you know, for now, this is this is what we have, and we just need to be more more aware. So using the blood test allow us to pick up on that and then hopefully um, dig deeper. And ideally it would be great if everyone did a more comprehensive um, you know, metabolic profile because ultimately that's what, you know, as the doctor I'm looking for, are we affecting metabolic health in a positive way? You know, are, are, and that's where rapamycin, you know, and partners, you know, can help. You know, as someone taking it, they want to feel better, right? <laughs> they they want to notice them, but I'm, I'm, a lot of people don't notice anything with subtly. You know, it's a subtle. Some people notice something. You know, sig you know they might have less pain, or they might have better energy, or uh, gum disease. You know, seems to improve um, joint pain. Uh, but you know, a lot of people it's just or they lose visceral fat. But you know, others it's like we're we're playing, we're putting a little insurance down that we're going to help ourselves. So we want to make sure that if we're doing that, we want to track or somehow measure. And hopefully over the, you know, the next year, we're going to get smarter and smarter um, using the people who are taking it. So we, we have that opportunity.